Hello and welcome to the Disabilities and Accommodations 101 workshop for Rutgers Biomedical and Health Sciences, faculty and staff, brought to you by the Office of Disability Services. Within this workshop, we will talk about different types of disabilities and what it may be like for a student with a disability to be in a classroom or a lab setting. It will also include how to refer students who may be struggling and how to accommodate students with disabilities in your courses. So if you are an instructor, professor, or staff at Rutgers Biomedical and Health Sciences, then keep listening. Because even if you don't have a student with a disability in your class now, you may in the future. I'm also going to ask you to find 8 to 10 pens that we will use in a role-playing activity later in the workshop. Thank you. We are going to start off this workshop by talking about what exactly a disability is, as defined by the Americans with Disabilities Act, as amended in 2008. According to the Americans with Disabilities Act, or the ADA, a disability is a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. A record of such an impairment, or being regarded as having such an impairment. But what exactly does that mean? In order for a student to be eligible for accommodations because of a disability, the disability has to limit a major life activity like breathing, walking, talking, hearing, seeing, eating, learning, reading, concentrating, or thinking. However, even if a student uses auxiliary aids like a sign language interpreter or takes medication, they can still be considered a person with a disability because the major life activity is still affected. The only exception is if a student has full vision while wearing glasses or using corrective lenses, then that student is not considered disabled. The definition also includes those who have a record of or are regarded as an individual with a disability. So what does that mean? Having a record of a disability means that a student may have had a disability when it is no longer present or does not limit a major life activity. Being regarded as someone with a disability means that a student may not have had an impairment that limits a major life activity, but others may assume they have a disability for a variety of reasons. Surgical scars or burns are examples of something that impacts a person's appearance, but may not limit a major life activity. Although having a record of or being regarded as an individual with a disability does not make a student eligible for accommodations, since no major life activities are impacted, they are still protected from discrimination under the Americans with Disabilities Act as amended in 2008. Now that we have talked about the definition of a disability, we are going to discuss the different types of disabilities your students may have. There are a variety of disabilities students may have. Some disabilities are more apparent than others, such as a physical disability, hearing loss or deafness, and vision loss or blindness. Physical disabilities are usually not considered hidden disabilities. Someone can be born with a physical disability or acquire one later on in life. A physical disability is one that affects or limits a major life activity that is physical, such as walking. Some physical disabilities are due to muscular or bone impairments, diseases, or degeneration. This includes impairments, such as those resulting from amputation, osteogenesis imperfecta, muscular dystrophy, and arthritis. Other physical disabilities are due to diseases, degeneration, or disorder of the nervous system. This includes impairments such as cerebral palsy, spina bifida, multiple sclerosis, paraplegia, quadriplegia, and polyomyelitis. Some disabilities are considered not visible, and you may not even realize someone has the disability or impairment. This may include psychological disabilities, autism, chronic illnesses, traumatic brain injuries, memory loss, low vision, hearing loss, and learning disabilities. Generally speaking, people with learning disabilities are of average or above average intelligence. According to the Learning Disabilities Association of America, there often appears to be a gap between the individual's potential and actual achievement. This is why learning disabilities are referred to as hidden disabilities since a person may not look like they have a disability, but they may be unable to demonstrate the skill level expected from someone of a similar age. Furthermore, according to the Learning Disabilities Association of America, learning disabilities are neurologically based processing differences. These processing differences can interfere with learning basic or executive functioning skills. 
Examples of learning disabilities are auditory processing disorder, dyscalculia, dysgraphia, dyslexia, language process disorder, nonverbal learning disabilities, and visual perceptual or visual motor deficit. Specific learning disabilities in math, reading, or writing are other common learning disabilities. ADHD, ADD, and dyspraxia are related to learning disabilities as well. A psychological disability is another type of disability that is often invisible and sometimes begins during college. Some examples of these disabilities are generalized anxiety disorder, depression, bipolar disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, schizophrenia, and eating disorders. Each of these psychological disabilities has its own symptoms, which may vary for each person. Chronic illnesses such as diabetes, lupus, cancer, fibromyalgia, and others may be apparent or hidden depending on the severity of the illness. Students may have a variety of different experiences in your classroom due to their disability or impairment. Every disability and every person with one is different, so each of their experiences may be different as well. Furthermore, just because a student's disability is not readily apparent, it does not mean that their disability is not affecting them in your classroom. A student with a learning disability may seem perfectly fine in a lecture, and you may think they aren't listening because they couldn't answer your simple question. In reality, they may have trouble processing the question and just need a few more minutes to answer. Or you may think that a student with a chronic illness is perfectly capable of coming to class that day. But in reality, the pain they're experiencing is so bad they truly are not able to attend. Research has shown that this population of students are highly impacted and influenced by how their professors treat them. Many do not inform their professor of their accommodations because they are afraid of being judged for their disability or of being treated as they are not as capable as their peers. Therefore, it is very important to not judge students who have accommodations and instead be supportive of them. Now that we have discussed some different types of disabilities and the fact that these students may have a variety of classroom experiences, we are going to run through some role-playing scenarios so you may be able to understand the perspective of students with these different disabilities. For all of these, you may imagine yourself in your own lecture or classroom, a fellow coworkers class, or just pretend this workshop is a lecture in RBHS class. First, you're going to role play as a student who is visually impaired. A picture on the slide has just faded in. I'd like you to take the next few seconds to describe this picture thoroughly. You can write down your description in a notebook or think about how you would describe it if you do not have a notebook or paper handy. As you can see, the one cat is not a normal color and even the orange cat has varying colors of orange in its fur. Now think about a student who is visually impaired and cannot see the image on the presentation. They would never know the picture was there or how unique the one cat looks unless you make your presentation accessible. Screen readers are able to read descriptions of pictures, but only if your presentation is accessible. Now think about how if this was your class and the image was essential for an exam or understanding a topic. What would your experience be like if you were the student and could not see this important image? Next, you're going to role play as a student who is deaf or has hearing loss. For the next 10 seconds, I would like you to cover your ears with your hands, and I'm going to play some white noise static in the background while I read a short passage. Within this workshop, we will talk about different types of disabilities. You may now uncover your ears and I have stopped the white noise sounds. Was there anything you weren't able to hear? If this were a lecture, you would have been able to read the PowerPoint. But without captioning or a sign language interpreter, you might have missed out on many things I said. If this happened to you during an undergraduate or graduate class, how would you have reacted? What would a student's experience in your class be like if they had a hearing impairment? You are now going to role play as a student with a learning disability. There are many different kinds of learning disabilities, and they can range in severity. 
This role-playing scenario will give you a general idea of what it is like to struggle against what your brain may be telling you. The following activity is from the Disability Awareness Activity Packet, written by Bev Adcock and Michael Remus. Now, I want you to read these words out loud. However, you must read the color the word is written in, and not the word itself. While reading these words, your brain probably wanted to read the actual word. Even when you made yourself do it correctly, you probably had to read at a much slower pace than normal. How did that make you feel? Was it frustrating to have to read at a slower pace? Or have to concentrate a little more? How might students with learning disabilities experience having to read at a slower pace in your own class? This is just one example of the daily challenges students with learning disabilities may face in order to process the information necessary to get through a lecture, a test, or even just the day. Their brain understands what needs to be done, but they struggle to process and express the information. Not being able to do this activity or having a learning disability does not mean someone isn't smart. It just means that the brain wants to do something different. People with learning disabilities are generally of average or above average intelligence, but there often appears to be a gap between the individual's potential and actual achievement. For our last role-playing scenario, you're going to role-play as a student with a chronic illness. This scenario comes from Christine Miserando's Spoon Theory and her experience with lupus. Christine states that the difference in being sick and being healthy is having to make choices or to consciously think about things when the rest of the world doesn't have to. The healthy have the luxury of a life without choices, a gift most people take for granted. Most people start the day with unlimited amount of possibilities and energy to do whatever they desire, especially young people. For the most part, they do not need to worry about the effects of their actions. So, right now, I'd like you to grab the pens I mentioned in the beginning of the workshop and hold them in your hand. You should have about 8 to 10 pens. These pens represent your energy or ability to do everyday tasks with ease. When you are healthy, you have an unlimited amount of pens. But when you have to plan your day with a chronic illness, you need to know exactly how many pens you are starting with. You always need to be conscious of how many pens you have, and don't drop any, because during this, you can never forget you have a chronic illness. Start thinking about the things you do during the day. All the tasks and chores or things you do for fun, each one will cost you a pen. Let's start with getting ready for the day. You open your eyes, but you don't just open your eyes. You have to crack open your eyes. And then you realize you are late. You didn't sleep well the night before. You have to crawl out of bed, which costs you your first pen. And then you have to make yourself something to eat before you can do anything else. Because if you don't, you can't take your medicine. And if you don't take your medicine, you might as well give up all your pens for today and tomorrow too. So take another pen away. Showering costs a pen just for washing your hair. Getting dressed is worth another pen. Think about how you would break down every task because every little detail needs to be thought about. You cannot simply just throw on clothes when your illness is active. You have to see what clothes you could physically put on. If your hands hurt that day, buttons are out of the question. If you have bruises that day, you need to wear long sleeves. And if you have a fever, you need a sweater to stay warm, and so on. If your hair is falling out, you may need to spend some more time to look presentable. And then you need to factor in another five minutes for feeling badly that it took you two or more hours to do all this. Theoretically, you didn't even get to school or class yet, and you're left with four to five pens, maybe more. Now you need to choose the rest of your day wisely, since when your pens are gone, they are gone. Sometimes you could borrow against tomorrow's pens, but just think how hard tomorrow will be at less. A person who is sick always lives with the looming thought that tomorrow may be the day that a cold comes or an infection or any number of things that can be very dangerous. So you do not want to run low on pens because you never know when you truly need them. You now only have a few pens left, but you still have to sit through class, listen, and take notes. These will cost you most of your pens before you have to drive home or even before your next class. You also don't want to run out of pens by the end of the day so you can safely drive home and be able to cook dinner or eat. 
Again, this is just one example of what it is like to live with a chronic illness. Now, think about how it felt to have to break down every activity, every task of your day. To have to think about and plan your day because you might not have enough pens. How did it feel? What do you think students may experience living with a chronic illness every day of their lives? This demonstration can help us understand what may be occurring with some of the students in your classroom or with future students. Rutgers Biomedical and Health Sciences Office of Disability Services, or ODS, provides the necessary tools, resources, and support for individuals with disabilities to become responsible decision makers and self-advocates in charge of their own education. ODS also provides resources for faculty who support these students on our website, which is listed at the end of this workshop on slide 12 called Resources for RBHS Faculty. The Office of Disability Services is dedicated to the philosophy that all Rutgers University students are assured equal opportunity, access and participation in the university's courses, programs, activities, services, and facilities. We recognize that diverse abilities are a source of strength, empowerment, and enrichment for the entire university community, and we are committed to the elimination of physical, instructional, and attitudinal barriers by promoting awareness and understanding throughout the university community. Our office is located at the Bergen Building on 65 Bergen Street in Newark. If you ever have any questions or concerns regarding a student with a disability or a student you may think has a disability, please contact our director at 973-972-5396 or by the email listed on this slide. If you have a student who you feel is struggling in certain aspects of your class, such as writing, answering questions orally, or if they often miss class, it could be for a variety of reasons. Students may be struggling due to family or personal issues, a disability, or they may just be having a bad day. If you have questions or concerns before you decide to refer a student, please contact our RBHS ODS office at 973-972-5396 or via email at odsrbhs.ca.ruckers.edu. Please also remember that even if you are in a medical profession, you cannot diagnose a student. The student can be diagnosed by their own doctor or have an evaluation done by GAZAP at their own expense. If you feel that a referral is appropriate, you may speak to them privately and refer them to the Student Wellness Program, the RBHS Writing Center, Health Services, and to our RBHS ODS office, located in the Bergen Building in Newark. You may also refer them to specific academic support or health and wellness programs within your specific school. A list of these references is located in the RBHS ODS student handbook. When speaking to the student, please remember to do it privately and avoid references, phrases, and words that suggest restrictions, limitations, or boundaries because these phrases tend to carry stereotypes and contribute to discriminating attitudes. You should also only discuss the behavior you are noticing in the classroom, such as difficulty in concentrating, and do not mention a specific disability. One suggestion of what you could say to a student with a possible learning disability in writing is, you have wonderful ideas and discussions during the class. However, I am not noticing the same work in your papers so there seems to be some sort of a disconnect between those two areas. If you'd like to receive additional support through the Writing Center, ODS, or our school's academic resources, I could refer you to areas on campus that could help. You may then provide them with the appropriate referral information. If you are referring them to RBHS ODS, then you may provide them with our office phone number or email. However, if the student is not sure about contacting ODS, you can provide them with our website and student handbook information, both of which are included in the resources at the end of this workshop, to provide them with more information on what our office does. The RBHS ODS student handbook is also located on our website under student accommodations. You may also want to provide the student information about academic or mental health support on campus and through your specific school. Furthermore, if a student gives you their documentation, please do not read the documentation. Instead, direct the student to provide the documentation to our ODS office. 
Students must take several steps in order to apply for accommodations. They must first complete and submit the registration form on the Rutgers website. This form is then sent to the director of the RVHS Office of Disability Services. The director sets up an intake meeting with the student to learn more about the student, their disability, and how it impacts them in and outside the academic environment. The student must also provide the appropriate documentation that demonstrates how their disability impacts a major life activity. This documentation helps ODS understand how the disability may impact the student and helps ODS make informed decisions about reasonable accommodations that would facilitate equal access for the student in courses, programs, facilities, and activities. After the intake, ODS will consider the information from the interview and the documentation to decide if the requested accommodations are appropriate, reasonable, and supported by a documentation. This information will be presented at a case review meeting as well, consisting of other ODS professionals from Rutgers, where the appropriate accommodations will be determined. If necessary, the student's program will be consulted to ensure that the accommodations do not alter the program's essential requirements. The student is then informed when a decision has been made. Their accommodation request may be approved, more information may be needed, or the application may not be approved and they will be informed why. If the accommodation request is approved, then the student will receive their letter of accommodations, which they are instructed to privately deliver and discuss to their professors. However, dental students meet with their academic affairs office rather than individual professors to deliver and discuss their letter of accommodations. Students must also renew their accommodations each semester or term, except for medical and dental students who renew yearly. Students may receive reasonable accommodations in the classroom, in labs, or in the clerkship settings. Accommodations never alter an educational program or academic requirements that are essential to a program of study. They are also not retroactive, so a student cannot apply them to past courses or use them until they are approved. Some accommodations are for exams or quizzes, which can include a large print, extended time, not using scantrons, and a reduced distraction testing location. Other exam or quiz accommodations include the use of a screen reader, scribe, computer or laptop, or text reader. Some examples of in-class accommodations include an American Sign Language Interpreter, Communication-Aided Real-Time Captioning, or CART, and Note-Taking Assistance. RBHS can also provide assistive technology, such as the use of a digital recorder to record lectures, a screen reader, a smart pen to record lectures and take notes, a text reader, or an AF system in class. Alternative formats for textbooks or course materials are also available to students who qualify for this. Accommodations in labs can include adaptive technology for the lab, such as the use of tablets, recording devices, smart pens, or amplified stethoscopes. Other accommodations include an American Sign Language Interpreter, Communication-Aided Real-Time Captioning, or CART, Note-Taking Assistance, height adjustable tables, or enlarged text and equipment labels. Accommodations in the clerkship setting can include periodical breaks, clerkship placements in areas that are accessible to the student if they qualify for a hardship accommodation, and time allocation for medical appointments. However, students need the proper documentation to demonstrate their need for any of these accommodations without fundamentally altering the clerkship. What is a letter of accommodations? A letter of accommodations, or LLA, is a document provided by the Office of Disability Services that explains to faculty the reasonable accommodations to be provided to a student. The letter of accommodations is given to students who have met all of the following criteria. Submitted appropriate documentation to verify their disability. Met with a representative from the Office of Disability Services have been approved as an individual who is covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act, Amendments Act of 2008, and or Section 504, and are eligible to receive reasonable accommodations at Rutgers University. The letter contains course accommodations approved by the Office of Disability Services based on the student's disability. Why am I receiving this letter of accommodations? 
You are receiving this letter as an official document from the university stating the student's approved accommodations. This letter serves as a way for the student to make themselves and their approved accommodations known to you. It is your responsibility to work with the student and the Office of Disability Services to ensure their accommodations are met. How should I receive the letter of accommodations? Students are encouraged to present letters of accommodations to their professor as early as possible. However, it should be understood that under some circumstances, like the student was approved for accommodations later in the semester, or the student was recently diagnosed, that the student may submit their letter later in the semester. Keep in mind that accommodations are not retroactive and are effective only upon submission of the LOA to the professor. Students are asked to present the LOA to their professor in private and not in front of other students. This approach protects the student's confidentiality regarding their disability and promotes a more healthy exchange between the student and the professor. Who should I contact if I have questions, comments, or concerns? You're not alone. The Rutgers Biomedical and Health Sciences Office of Disability Service is here to help answer any questions and or address any concerns you may have. All letters of accommodation are produced by the director of the RVHS ODS and includes their contact information. They are a great resource to reach out to if you have questions regarding the accommodations. The Office of Disability Services can be reached through our main office number at 973-972-5396 or via email at odsrbhs at ca.ruckers.edu. What to know when discussing a student's accommodations after you receive the LOA? Please remember, this should be a private conversation. This approach protects the student's confidentiality regarding their disability and promotes a more healthy exchange between the student and the professor. During this meeting, you should not ask the nature of the student's disability, nor make assumptions regarding the type of disability. Many of our students have invisible disabilities. The purpose of this meeting is for you and the student to both understand the approved accommodations and the specific manner in which these accommodations will be implemented in your course, such as if a student is approved for exam-related accommodations, how will those arrangements be made, through you or through our office? If further assistance is needed, you can contact our office via phone or email. The letter of accommodation should also include a rights and responsibility form, which serves as a summary of your meeting and an agreement of the arrangements you and the student have made. Both the professor and the student should sign this form. ODS asks that the student return a copy of this signed form to our office. Please also retain a copy of both the LOA and the rights and responsibility form for your own records. What are my responsibilities versus the student's responsibilities? First and foremost, it is the student's responsibility to begin the process. It is the student's responsibility to request the letter of accommodations from the Office of Disability Services every semester, term, or year, depending on the student's program and school. It is the student's responsibility to self-identify and provide you with this letter in a timely manner. It is the student's responsibility to meet with you to discuss the accommodations listed on the LOA and the manner in which they are implemented in the class. As a professor, it is your responsibility to meet with the student. The purpose of this meeting is for you and the student to both understand the approved accommodations and the specific manner in which the accommodations will be implemented in your course. If you have any questions or concerns about the accommodations listed, it is your responsibility to contact our office directly. You can contact our office at 973-972-5396 or via email at odsrbhs at ca.ruckers.edu. What if a student does not have a letter of accommodations? If a student does not have a letter of accommodations, you are not legally required to provide any accommodations to the student. Please direct the student to contact the Office of Disability Services directly. Furthermore, all of this information is from the Faculty FAQ Letter of Accommodations website, which is located on this slide and at the end of the workshop. It is important to accommodate students within your classroom or labs. This includes making your Word documents, PowerPoint presentations, and all online materials accessible for all students. The following are suggestions on what you can do to make your Word documents and PowerPoints more accessible and why. Use the links on the current slide if you'd like to know the exact steps on how to make these changes for PCs and Macs. 
in the Cheat Sheets for Accessibility website. This website also has information on how to make Excel and Adobe accessible, as well as making accessible web content and YouTube captioning. The link is also included on the resources for RBHS faculty slide. There are multiple ways you can make your Microsoft Word documents accessible for all students. You can create a uniform structure using heading styles, create alternative text for images, and use true columns and true numbered or bulleted lists. You should also make your hyperlink text unique and descriptive, and create a clear table structure and header for any data tables. These changes allow a screen reader to navigate and read a document, which improves accessibility. Without these changes, the screen readers may not be able to read the document to the student, which can be confusing and unhelpful. For example, without adding alternative text for images, a screen reader will not inform the user about the image, and a student with a vision disability may never know the image is on the document. Furthermore, students with various disabilities, not just visual impairments, use screen readers, which demonstrates the importance of these accommodations. You can also check if your Microsoft Word document is accessible. This checker presents accessibility errors, warnings, and tips for making changes. When creating Word documents, you should ensure that the font size is sufficient, around 12 points. Provide sufficient contrast, don't use color as the only way to convey meaning. Provide a table of contents for long documents. And use simple language. There are multiple ways you can make your Microsoft PowerPoints accessible for all students as well. And many are similar to the accommodations for Word documents. You should use slide layouts and add alternative text for images. If you insert other content into a slide, like a text box or image, it will be read by a screen reader in the order it is added to the page. And you can also check or fix the reading order after creating the slide. You should also make your hyperlink text unique and descriptive and create a clear table structure and header for any data tables. Try to keep your table simple because there's no way to add table header information in a way that will be identified by a screen reader. All these accommodations ensure that the screen reader will be able to read the PowerPoint correctly, which is essential for students who use screen readers. You can also check if your PowerPoint is accessible. The accessibility checker will show accessibility errors, warnings, and tips on how to repair the errors. When creating PowerPoints, you should also ensure your font size is sufficient and provide sufficient contrast. If your presentation will be viewed on a projector, the font size may need to be even larger, and the contrast may need to be even more pronounced. Furthermore, you should not use color as the only way to convey meaning. Avoid using automatic slide transitions, and use simple slide transitions when possible. Do not put accessibility information, like alternative text, in the slide notes. Ensure that embedded videos have captions. Include a transcript for embedded audio. Use simple language. And if you use animations, ensure that they are brief and do not distract from the most important content on the slide. The sources for all this information have come from the National Center on Disability and Access to Education's Accessibility Cheat Sheets. The website links for these sources are on this slide as well as the resources for RVHS faculty slide and the resources used in this workshop slide. These are the resources for RVHS faculty. It includes the websites for RVHS ODS, faculty support for students with disabilities, frequently asked questions, training modules specifically for RVHS faculty, and cheat sheets for accessibility. The link for the RVHS ODS student handbook is also on this slide. These are the resources for ways to support students with disabilities. It has links for the websites on ways to support students with all disabilities, support for blind or visually impaired students, support for students with mobility impairments, support for deaf or hearing impaired students, and support for students with learning disabilities. This slide contains more resources on ways to support students with disabilities. It includes the links for the websites on support for students with speech impairments, support for students with mental health conditions, support for students with other disabilities, 
and recommendations for all courses. This slide includes all the resources I used to create and write this workshop. It has the source for the learning disability role-playing scenario and the three research articles I mentioned on slide four that demonstrate the importance of faculty perception or views of students with disabilities. It also includes the websites for the Rutgers Faculty FAQ, the Learning Disabilities Association of America, the Microsoft Word and PowerPoint Accommodation Cheat Sheet, and the Spoon Theory by Christine Miserando.